Okay, so we want to um, kind of plow through. Uh, we need to plow through. I'm going to show you something a little bit later and see if we can get out of here. About 15, 20 minutes early at least today, hopefully. Uh, but we got a few things we need to work through. Um, we left off last time with the election of 1800, right? The election of 1800, um, or the revolution of 1800 as it's often called. And uh, remember, it's called the Revolution of 1800 in many ways because it is going to be revolutionary because of the fact, really because of what doesn't happen rather than what does happen. Um, if you remember, what does happen is the other party wins. Right? The other party wins. The anti-federalists are going to win. Jefferson uh, gets the win. And for some, that raises alarm bells because the federalists have been in power, and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams do not get along. Right? So some think that this could be revolutionary. It could start a civil war because of the fact that one party is lost, the other party is won. They do not get along. Is there going to be a peaceful transition of power? Right? Is there or is there not going to be a peaceful transition of power? Um, thankfully, there is a peaceful transition of power in 1800, and I think that that's going to be doubly significant because, again, it sets a blueprint for... Uh, the rest of American history, right? For the last couple of hundred years, we've had peaceful transitions of power, even if the two candidates don't get along, even if they can't stand each other, right? There's a tradition of, of handing over the reins. Um, even in the last election, again, there was threats of it didn't go a certain way, that there might be violence, but maybe the fact that we have a history of uh, addressing this and dealing with this in a positive way um, helps us in this instance, right? We've seen in other moments in world history Less than this might lead to civil war. So this election of 1800 is important. What we're going to be doing now is we are now in the 19th century, right? And so we want to look at 19th century developments in the U.S. Um, and so we can do a bit of that today. Um, this election does bring Thomas Jefferson to the White House. And Thomas Jefferson is one of these kind of quintessential figures, right? Complicated, controversial. Some say maybe he's the most complex person in American political history. Um, so he's a good, I think, lens to use to, to examine the period, to look through his eyes at what the period looks like. And we'll talk about why he's complicated and why many consider him uh, contradictory. Uh, Jefferson is inaugurated as the third president of the United States uh, in March of 1801. Right? So March of 1801, he's officially installed, inaugurated, and he's in the big chair. Right? So part of what we need to do is look at how he's going to act in the big chair because before this, he had been critical of the person sitting in the big chair, what they could and could not do. And so he's going to be tested in some ways, um, I think now based on the fact that he's the one in power. Um, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson do not get along so much that John Adams refuses to attend Jefferson's inauguration. He doesn't show up. Right? He's like, whatever, let that guy do what he's going to do. But on one level, that's okay, because he does hand over the keys to the White House. He gives them all the key cards. <laughs> he doesn't burn up the furniture, right? He, he hands over power peacefully, even though he's so disgusted that he will not attend the inauguration. He kind of breaks that tradition of, of folks attending the next person's uh, inauguration. But despite that, the Federalists do give up power voluntarily, and so uh, Jefferson and his party will come to the White House. So. Many people say this is important because it shows that the constitutional process works. Right? Even if you disagree with the results, um, it works in this instance. And so again, this is an important lesson. Jefferson himself, right? Jefferson himself is incredibly complicated. You can look at countless biographies of him, books on him, and kind of see how fascinated people have been with him. Um, and this is for a variety of reasons, right? On one hand, Jefferson is this unique rare Renaissance man, right? He's, he's an intellect known for his, his writing, right? His, his having read various um, texts of uh, <laughs> the classics in Europe and everything here in America, right? To kind of make him a quintessential Renaissance figure. Um, he is incredibly complicated. He's the author of the Declaration of Independence, right? It's, I think it's telling that the Founding Fathers ask him to be part of the committee to draft this document, right? He's known for the power of his pen, right? 
out. <coughs> They're like, yeah, yeah, Tom can write the, the Declaration of Independence, right? He'll come up with some great stuff about why we should be free. And he does. I think about some of the phrases that come out of the Declaration, all men are created equal, and right, these arguments about how, how the king doesn't deserve our respect anymore and how you know, we're free and we will not be enslaved. But think also about the contradictions, perhaps, and the fact that he's writing those words while owning a couple hundred slaves. I always imagine Thomas Jefferson, right, who's known for the power of his pen. Uh, he was kind of a hip-hop artist at the time. He's like the Jay-Z of the time. Okay, here, look, write something nice. Write something that sounds good, right? And J. Cole, write, write, some, write some lyrics, Tom. Go ahead and come back. Right? Go into your garage and come back and uh, show us what you, ha what you have. And so... Tom, Tom Jefferson is probably really excited when he's penning these words, right? He's crossing stuff off and he's coming up with phrases that sound really great, right? Imagine him talking to his friends, people nearby uh, on a farm saying, wow, look what I wrote. Look at this one. Look at this one. This one's good. All men are created equal. Isn't that cool? Right? Isn't that cool? But think about the contradictions because one of those people that he would have been pulling to take a look at the document would have been Jupiter Jefferson. Uh, Jupiter Jefferson uh, grew up on the same farm is the exact same age as Thomas Jefferson. Right, they're both male. Right, when Thomas Jefferson went off to college, Jupiter goes with him. They both found their wives at that time. But what was the difference between Thomas and Jupiter? Well, Jupiter was Thomas Jefferson's slave. So as Thomas Jefferson is writing words like all men are created equal, he might then say, look, I'm, I'm really thirsty. Jupiter, go get me some, some, some lemonade. Right? And Jupiter may have been like, wait a second. I thought you just wrote that everybody's equal. Why don't you go get your own lemonade? You go, go down the street to the vending machine. 7-Eleven is right there. Right? You go, there's a dollar. Go. Why do I have to get it? In some ways, even penning such words in this context is going to raise contradictions. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is looking out at his slaves, pick his tobacco. Yet he's able to pen you know, some of the most important words perhaps ever written about freedom. Now, some historians have pointed to this as not a contradiction at all, but maybe, maybe one depends on the other. Right? Edmund Morgan, a historian of Virginia, colonial Virginia, has argued that it's not a coincidence that so many of the founding fathers come from Virginia. Right? Patrick Henry, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. In part because slavery was so important to Virginia that they could literally look out and see slavery, right, tangibly. It wasn't a theory. They could literally see people that were not free and decide, I never want to be that king. Right, so when Patrick Henry says, give me liberty or give me death, that's not just theoretical. Um, so some say maybe one depended on the other. So think about what you think about sort of Jefferson in this way. I find it interesting because Jefferson on one level is so rare, so unique. On another level, he's very much the common person of the time, right? the average person of the time in his views on slavery and race and class perhaps even right so he's a good he's a good lens I think to examine this period right he's complex he's complicated everyone would definitely agree on that All right so as he's becoming the author of the Declaration of Independence he's also the owner of several hundred slaves um, recently or more recently of course there's been renewed controversy over Jefferson particularly his relationship with another one of those slaves um, Sally Hemings Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings was a slave on the Jefferson plantation, and there had been rumors that Jefferson had fathered children with her. Um, during one of the earlier elections, one of his political opponents kind of brought this up. Right? So imagine that campaign, right? Imagine that debate where they're going back and forth about the issues and his, uh, his opponents like, yeah, that's why he got African kids. Right? Everybody's like, ooh. <laughs> you know how it goes, right? So he would always deny it in the course of his lifetime because that, you know, would have been kind of political suicide. But on the plantation, it was well known, right? It was kind of the oral history of the time. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, the Hemings side of the family definitely understood and believed that, you know, he was the father. Um, more recently, with DNA testing, it was proved that he did father several children with Sally Hemings. And this is problematic for many, in part because of the huge age difference between them fact that she was his slave, so therefore the power dynamics, right? Uh, in 2019, we would call that either sexual harassment or worse, rape, right? Because the power was not aligned. At the time, they wouldn't have called it that. Right? 
So it's, it's complicated. <laughs> I'll definitely say that much. It's, it's complicated. The fact that he was a slaveholder, bless you, is true. But the fact that he was a slaveholder meant that he was not breaking the law and owning slaves either. Remember, this was a legal institution uh, that was founded you know, before our country. So you decide what you think about these complexities, right, these complexities. Um, again, Jefferson was from Virginia, so in many ways this does kind of place him in line with many of the other founding fathers, right, the sort of elite status, the traditional politics and such, but uh, he was really from the western part of the state. Right? Some say that this made him more oriented towards the frontier than like old muddy kind of Virginia. Right? Jefferson was, you know, he had this appearance of being extremely wealthy at all times and he has tremendous wealth, but there are several moments when he, like, he's selling slaves because he's concerned he's going to go bankrupt as well. But he always did have this kind of fascination with the small independent farmer, and maybe more that had to do with the fact that he's more from the western part of the state, the frontier, the lesser developed part. Um, so he's, he's significant and, and I think in, important on another number of levels, uh, on a number of levels. Um, Jefferson was also unusual in that he was formally educated. Right? He had attended the College of William and Mary, right? college educated, which was rare for a southern planter at the time. I kind of talked about some of that. Um, he, in fact, will be one of the founders and architects of the University of Virginia. He's long been fascinated with science and technology, right? Uh, he's, a, he's a Renaissance figure, yet in some ways he's both unique and also just like a lot of other folks at the time with all of their same flaws. Um, so <laughs> he's complicated. At the same time, Jefferson had also been a, a critic of those in power before. Remember, going back to our conversations about the Constitution, Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists with him were very critical of too much federal power, too much top-down power, right? too strong an executive branch. But now he's in the big chair. So is he gonna change his mind? Right? Is he gonna change his mind now that he's the one with the power? We'll have to see how his presidency plays out. Uh, his first priority as president is reducing the national debt. Right, reducing the national debt. That sounds familiar, right? That's a common <laughs> political goal now in the 21st century. He felt that the, the national debt um, had increased too much and that this could be a threat to our liberty. Right? He sets about cutting the federal budget primarily by reducing the size of the military that he thought had grown too much under his predecessor, John Adams. Right. Remember, traditionally, Americans do not like having large standing armies. Right? We're, we're sort of opposed to that, perhaps because of our founding, right? because of the fact that we felt we were dealing with the British, that, that large kind of occupation force that was there. Right? We felt, we feel like it's great to have a strong military, but if the military is too much involved in daily life, it could actually be a threat to the republic and not a defender of the republic. So even think about how our political system is organized, right? Our president is a civilian position. Even if it's a former general, they become a civilian at that point. Eisenhower, <coughs> for instance, right? It's, a, it's supposed to be a separation there because we're often afraid of too much influence looking at some of the examples from world history. So Jefferson himself will uh, reduce the size of the military. He thought had grown too much under the Federalists. He cuts taxes including an excise tax on distilled grain right, that helped cause uh, the Whiskey Rebellion earlier, 1794. Right, remember the Whiskey Rebellion, it was a rebellion of Pennsylvania farmers, kind of similar to what we saw with Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts. So that Whiskey Rebellion might still be fresh in people's mind, but he will cut taxes as part of the attempt to kind of balance the budget. Um, some say the greatest achievement of Jefferson's administration will be the Louisiana Purchase, right, the Louisiana Purchase. But it's also going to be one of these tests of his administration. It will also be one of the tests. Well, why? Well, because of the way it plays out, I think it's going to, um, it's going to cause him to question certain things, even some of the things he had said earlier in his political life. So we will purchase Louisiana Territory from France in 1803, and the Louisiana Purchase will more than double the size of the United States. 
be more than double the size of the country. It's going to extend our western boundary all the way to the Rocky Mountains. All the way to the Rocky Mountains. I want to use this as, a, as an opportunity to go back to some bigger concepts right, that we have touched on or are about to touch on or are continuing to touch on. Um, one of them is the notion of the West. I talk a bit about the West today, and I want to show you something having to do with the West. But I put the West in quotes specifically because the West is really an idea. West is an idea. If we think about those original 13 colonies that are along the eastern seaboard, right? So everything west of them is the west. Right? At one point, bless you. At one point, the west is Ohio, the Northwest Territory. At one point, the west is Chicago. St. Louis, gateway to the west. Of course, you know, in California, we're as interested in the west as California, right? Best state in the union, all of that. So I think it's interesting to, th to see how the West moves. Right? It's almost like a wave, right? but also how it's an idea and how influential the idea is going to be for American identity. Think about the West and notions of cowboys and Native Americans and the open range and that freedom and land and all that kind of stuff. I bless you. Like a lot of that plays into our national identity as well. So keep in mind this kind of larger idea of the West. This term manifest destiny did not yet exist in the period we're talking about. The term manifest destiny is not coined until 1845. So we'll talk about it a bit more when we get to coin. But I'm gonna argue that it already exists in our mind. And even though we didn't have the label, we already have the, the idea of the term. Basically, a kind of working definition of manifest destiny is that we are destined to reach the fullness of our dreams. Destined to reach the fullness of our dreams. Term won't exist until 1845. We'll talk about how and why that happens. But the idea is we're going to grow. And then eventually, we're going to go from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific. It's already written. It's already begun. We'll see how the actual term develops. Now, the term we have talked about is American exceptionalism. Right, I want you to think again about this big umbrella term, American exceptionalism. We talked about at least the first part of the definition of American exceptionalism being this idea that there's something exceptional about the United States. Right? There's something exceptional about this nation. Almost something chosen. It's almost like we're a chosen people, that God put us here for a reason, and he's going to make sure we succeed. That belief is going to be a very strong one, and many folks are going to see constant evidence of this in our history. We've talked already about a few of the examples of that people saw as evidence of you know, the fact that God was on our side, this, this fact that we can't possibly fail and all of this. Right? So think about that. We talked about the colonial period, right? The pilgrims arriving and you know setting up their city on the hill because God didn't want them to do that. Right? The fact that they almost starved. Yeah, okay, that's that's one thing, but they know they're gonna make it because they're set up for a particular purpose, a religious mission. Jamestown, those first few years, those starving times, it's difficult, it's rough, it's horrible, but they make it, they survive. So I think Americans look at that and they're like, look, we're supposed to make it. Even if it's some miraculous way that we survive, we're going to survive. Right? Those colonies start to grow and flourish. And Jamestown didn't have a crop and then they have tobacco. Right? Come on, it's a miracle. The revolution. Think about the Revolutionary War. There's no way we should beat Great Britain. No way. It's a long shot. But we win. Some are going to say, man, we're exceptional. There's, God must be on our side. Even before that, we talked about Native peoples, right, sort of being in the way, right, being occupying this space, whether it's New England or another area, and suddenly they're gone, whether it's disease, that it's going to force them out, which is most often the case, that even that may be an act of God. So think about this notion of American exceptionalism and how we keep seeing evidence, at least from our perspective, that God is like blessing what we're doing. The Louisiana Purchase fits this definition too. How? How so? Well, the Louisiana Purchase it ends up being a fantastic deal. Some say the best land deal in history. Right? And Jefferson is, is in charge of it, essentially. He's, it kind of falls in his lap in a kind of literal way. Um, Jefferson initially sends representatives to France, 
with the intention on buying just the port of New Orleans. I, it's like, look, if we can get the port of New Orleans, this will be fantastic for the nation. Right? Not because he was a Drew Brees fan in the Saints, but because the port of New Orleans was at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Therefore, whoever controls it controls trade up and down the Mississippi River, which was the most important you know, river in terms of trade. People were sailing stuff all the way down the river and out to Europe. Long before roads, before railroads, this is going to be the way that most goods and services would be moved. So if they could have just gotten the, the port of New Orleans, they would have been happy. So he sends representatives to France, initially with the goal of only obtaining New Orleans. Whoever controlled New Orleans right, controls the trade and the movement of boats up and down the Mississippi. Extremely important. But world history will intervene, right? World history will intervene. We might say this American exceptionalism pops up again because France's Emperor Napoleon is in serious need of money, right? Serious need of cash. And the French will indicate their willingness to sell the entire Louisiana territory for only $15 million. Entire territory. We're talking about 13 states eventually carved out of this for $15 million. Mike Trout makes more than that. You only get 13 states. Why? How and why? What happens in terms of world history? Well, uh, Britain and France, of course, are fighting each other, as, as always. Um, and so Napoleon is in need of cash for that. And just as importantly, or maybe even more importantly, France has just lost its most important, most profitable, wealthiest colony. The colony of Santo Domingo or San Domingue, which we now call Haiti. Haiti was a slave colony of the French, its wealthiest slave colony. It, was, it produced sugar. It would produce sugar. And it produced more wealth for the French than any other colony. Well, what happens? Well, think about the context, right? We have the American Revolution, all these ideas thrown out about all men are created equal, right? liberty or death, and then we win. Right? The French have a revolution shortly thereafter, get rid of their king, form a republic, essentially. Well, all these ideas now are out there. Right? They're out there. And one of France's colonies, a slave colony, hearing these ideas, might just say, you know what? sounds good. That all men are created equal stuff, that sounds pretty good. Right? Once you let the cat out of the bag, it's hard to kind of force the cat back in the bag without it getting scratched. So don't try to put cats in bags, just, just so you know. It's just a figure of speech. Figure of speech. So in Haiti, they're like, yeah, we're not going to be slaves anymore. The French are like, yes, you are. And at first, it, it probably was an intellectual argument. Well, wait, you said that all men are created equal, and liberty, equality, fraternity, all that. No, no, we didn't intend that for you. That was for us, that wasn't for you. And so the slaves were like, ah, you may not have intended it for us, but we're gonna go ahead and take it anyway. So the French will attempt to reconquer the island and they will lose. Right? Napoleon sends his own brother-in-law to try to reconquer the island with an army and his brother-in-law gets killed. Haiti will be the second independent republic in the Western Hemisphere. The second independent republic in the Western Hemisphere rename itself Haiti and declare its independence. What's the first independent republic in the Western Hemisphere? Us, the United States. So suddenly Napoleon has an issue. He needs money, he's lost his most profitable colony, a place where he would have been able to defend Louisiana territory, right, from Haiti, only what, 400 miles off our coast? And so he's willing to sell the entire Louisiana territory, $15 million, two or three cents an acre. Fantastic deal. So again, think about how we might interpret that as American exceptionalism. Jefferson sends these folks over to get New Orleans, and these delegates had to be incredibly shocked by what they find. Right? They arrive there and they're like, "Wait, what? We can get the whole thing? Fifteen million? They're like, "Deal. Don't you need to text Jefferson? No, no, don't worry about that. Deal. Where do I sign?" They, they, they agree to it, and they basically ask permission after the fact. That's basically how it's going to go. When news of the proposed treaty makes it back home, Jefferson is incredibly happy. He's like, oh, my goodness, it's a lottery ticket. But he's like, uh-oh, can I do it? 
Because remember, Jefferson had been the one saying you can only do what's in the Constitution. Does the Constitution allow this kind of unilateral purchase of massive lands without a vote, without all these things that Jefferson had argued for? No, not really. But it's too good a deal. Right? It's too good a deal. Figure it out later. I figure it out later. So he is very happy, but he's also worried that the federal government does not have the constitutional authority to make such a purchase. But the Senate will ultimately ratify the, the treaty, and the Louisiana Territory will become part of the U.S. So we doubled the size of the young nation by writing a check. Right? Not by warfare. We didn't have to you know, go to war, but by doubling, uh, by writing a check. And in fact, we're going to borrow the money from England pay it to France, France and England are at war with each other. So they, <laughs> it's, it's, cra it's crazy when you think of how, how this works out, but you couldn't write fiction as strange as history in some cases. So we actually buy it sight unseen, right? We buy this, we don't even know what's really in it. This is largely unexplored territory. It's kind of like, I don't know if any of you watch HG, HGTV like I do. I'm not very handy, but I like watching other people that are. Huh? No, which one? I was thinking of uh, all the all the flippers and, and things, right? right? They sort of sometimes they buy a house sight unseen. Right? You'll buy a, a house that's foreclosed, like the door might be nailed shut. They're like peeking through the window, like I don't know, it looks like it might be okay. And they get a really good deal, right? A really good deal. They go in there and they flip it, and then sell it for a bunch more, right? Because it's worth more once you know what you have and once you can improve it. We kind of buy this without really knowing what's there, right? And so now that we purchased it, we got to figure out what we bought. And so the next step will be for Jefferson to get Congress to fund exploration of the Louisiana Territory. He will get this funding led by his personal secretary and protege, a man named Meriwether Lewis. Lewis gets his friend William Clark to be co-captain of the mission, and with about three dozen folks, they will set off from St. Louis, Missouri in 1804. So if you ever go to St. Louis and see the arch, that's the gateway to the west. And you rate this kind of uh, exploration of the west that essentially is going to happen. Think about this idea of the west, that it really is an idea. We don't even know what's in there. Right? We don't even necessarily know what's there at this point. They will reach the Pacific Ocean late the following year. Now, although their primary mission was to find an all-water route to the Pacific, they think that they can get on a river and, and sail all the way to the Pacific um, to facilitate trade with Asia. Um, ultimately, what's going to come of this is they're going to be responsible for cataloging the plants and animals, many of which they had never seen before, flora and fauna that they had never seen, as well as making contact with various Native American societies in this um, territory. As you're going to see, they're guided um, by a, a Native American woman by the name of Sacagawea, Sacagawea, heard it pronounced different ways, um, who actually saves them on a couple of occasions, and they learn a tremendous amount during this trip. They will eventually reach the Pacific, but there was no all-water route, right? The Rocky Mountains were in the way. And they learned that too. <laughs> but they will reach the Pacific. So again, think about this term, manifest destiny. No, it doesn't exist yet. But in many ways, we are going to make this contact with the Pacific early in the 19th century, long before 1845. So it is, this is, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's, it seems like a miracle to many. It seems like a miracle. For many decades, all we knew about much of the region was based on the extensive journals of Lewis and Clark. We had to go back and study those journals because we didn't have any other knowledge of it. Now, in terms of foreign policy, Jefferson is not seen as being as successful as he was <laughs> domestically. Right? Foreign policy is a difficult thing, as we're going to see. Both the, the first two presidents had some difficulties with foreign policy, in part because the world is so, you know, so complicated. Um, he had a minor war against Tripoli in 1801 to 1805 to try to protect uh, American shipping and such. So think about from the shores of Tripoli, where this comes from. <clears throat> Some see this as at least a moderately successful in protecting American interests abroad. A lot of this, though, is about us declaring our sovereignty. Right? A lot of this is about us trying to build this nation. And we are not caught up yet to Britain. We're not caught up to some of the other powers in Europe. 
Um, we feel like we're going that direction, but we are not there yet. We are not equal yet in terms of power. For example, when the War of 1812 comes, which we'll talk about in a second, when the War of 1812 comes, there are 17 ships in the American Navy. 17 ships. There are 1,000 ships in the British Navy. So in terms of relative strength, we're still not there, but we can hold our own. We've shown that, and I think we're going to show it uh, again several times in this period. So uh, Jefferson's second term is also seen as, um, in some ways, uh, difficult in terms of foreign policy. We're going to see an increase. Right? We're going to see an increase in tensions abroad, especially tensions with England, right? especially tensions with England, which is going to be successful because ultimately this will lead to uh, renewed conflict with England, right? renewed conflict 